glasses, so that helped. All right. Good evening. Welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is Thursday, October 2nd, 2014. May I please have the attendance? Mrs. Healy? Here. Mrs. Chiazzo? Here. Mrs. Ling? Here. Mrs. Massagill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Terry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Mrs. Here. Shea? Go ahead. Mrs. Murray? Be, Here. Mrs. Hart? I'll be fine. Here. Would you please join me to the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Dr. Entwistle, are there any adjustments this evening to the agenda? I do not believe so. All right. Then moving on to 5.0, we have the superintendent's report this evening. Um, yes, I have a few brief items, uh, just a couple of updates to the board. Pleased to share with you that uh, my classroom visitation schedule, uh, which was really a, a sort of a fun and very productive venture last year, um, is currently being developed. Uh, Kelly has sent out invitations for all of our brand new teachers and professionals as well as our fifth year and sixth year um, teachers and professionals to um, schedule time for both a visit observation and a debrief um, with all of those folks. Last year, as you know, I did it with first year, second year, and third year. They all advanced, so now it's first year, fifth year, and sixth year year, uh, folks. So I'm really looking forward to that. It was a great way to get it on the schedule. It drives Kelly a little crazy, but get it, get it, get it on the schedule and uh, really make sure that um, those classroom visits happen. It's uh, been very productive. Um, our first PLT facilitators seminar was held yesterday, with approximately 60 facilitators in attendance. Um, it was a, a good group, a very enthusiastic group. Uh, this is a seminar model that we're doing this year in place of the uh, graduate class because we felt that we had um, had enough folks who had gone through the graduate class and we will offer that class, which is teacher leadership and professional learning teams, again next year. So in the absence of that, we're doing s five seminars uh, throughout the year for the facilitators, basically ensuring that they are supported and on track in terms of their um, leadership of their professional learning team. Uh, it's probably important to know that our na next late start for um, professional learning teams will be on Wednesday, October 8th, and we're looking forward to getting those teams off to um, a, a great start on their work. Um, you'll find in front of you a, um, a school board um, workshop schedule, which now includes or has integrated into the existing um, agenda items, the topics that you all as a board brainstormed and vetted um, and prioritized. Uh, you'll see on the second page that both um, business meetings and workshops are being populated by important topics, uh, report outs, and discussion items. So um, that has now been integrated into your schedule. Just a couple of quick items. Um, the Jim Dandies are appearing in the Christmas Day Parade on October 13th. Uh, the Jim Dandies are the only invited parade participants who are not from the New York City, Tri-City area, Tri-State area. Um, this will be the Jim Dandies' second appearance in New York City. The first was at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 2005. Um, it's interesting to know that this Columbus Day Parade in New York City is one of the largest parades in the United States. Uh, with an expected over one million spectators. Mm -hmm. so we wish them the best of luck and safe travels to our Jim Dandies. Uh, the last is um, just a, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but uh, there is a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Wentworth School, um, which will be held on, am I stealing it? Feel free. Okay, mm -hmm. well you can say it too. Um, <laughs> held on Saturday, October 18th at 1 p.m. Um, and the public is uh, cordially invited to attend. A reception and tours will follow the ribbon cur cutting ceremony. So we're very excited to have that um, happening. Um, as part of my superintendent's report as well, um, and uh, this is something that you've been hearing a bit about, we've been talking about the, the extension uh, for proficiency-based diplomas. This is a, a piece of legislation that went into place. Um, 
the Department of Education has come up with um, extension um, applications and options, and um, Monique is going to uh, walk us through um, the Scarborough application. We also have uh, David Creech and Barbara Hathorn here um, as high school and middle school principals who have been uh, very involved in uh, this planning and, and basically um, it's been the four of us who have been involved in the development of the extension application. Thank you so much, Dr. Antwistle. <coughs> the, um, I'm pleased to present to you tonight our application. Uh, this application will go into the Department of Education, and it's an application to extend the implementation of a statute regarding new graduation requirements. Uh, and the statute states <coughs> that all students who graduate after January of 2018, and we're looking for an extension to extend that out to all students who graduate after January 1st of 2020. So it's a two-year extension. So that would mean instead of our current freshmen in high school, it would in, um, impact our current seventh graders. But before I get into details around the application, what I'd like to share <coughs> with you is uh, a little bit of context. If you recall, back in December of 2013, uh, Dr. Entwistle and I presented um, a PowerPoint presentation around the Common Core and Standards-Based Learning. <clears throat> In that presentation, we talked about what is standards-based learning, and we also talked about that's the same thing as proficiency-based learning, where we have standards and we work helping students reach those standards, and we work towards that proficiency, which means that they um, show what they know in terms of their learning. We also talked about student-centered learning and what that means in terms of a student-centered learning system. It is proficiency-based, but it's a little bit more than that. It's really about personalizing the education, and again, you'll notice in the law it talks about multiple pathways, but it's also about looking at organizational structures to ensure that we're making our decisions to improve student learning, not necessarily for organizational equilibrium, and that involves staffing, schedules, all that sort of thing. What it means for Scarborough, as I reported back in December, was that we took a look at our 18-month improvement strategy and we refocused, focusing on college and career readiness, but also continued our work within our curriculum, but also to begin developing some of those proficiencies and examining our structures and processes. Then in February of 2014, Dr. Entwistle and I presented to you our progress on the 18-month improvement strategy. And within that, we talked about the focus, trying to keep the focus on teaching and learning and making steady incremental gains in that area. And again, the student-centered learning is becoming more evident in our schools, but we have a ways to go. And our progress depends on our investments in terms of time, effort, and money. And so we're focusing on those organizational shifts so that they will enable more equal access for all students. Part of this initiative is about all students and student-centered learning. But also, we really want to make sure that we're getting value for every dollar spent. And that's where making some organizational shifts means more efficient, effective utilization. And in fact, all our organizational shifts do because they're focused on student learning. Also, the learning, the kind of learning that this enables us to provide to students is more relevant instead of just learning the content or applying, having students apply the content. And as you recall, we did a little update about what was going on at each of the phases for K-2 and the high school is exploring systems and processes. And we noticed in, um, as we reported, the high school is involved in designing and implementing that proficiency-based graduation um, learning and diploma requirement. So it's been on the high school's radar, but also K-12, we've been having conversations as well. To give you a little bit of background in terms of what the law actually states, it really talks about our students being engaged in educational experiences, not courses anymore. Also not credits. The current state law involves credits. Students earn credits to graduate. One significant shift is that students will demonstrate proficiency. They will demonstrate what they know. In two areas, all content areas are the learning results, math, science, social studies, but also the guiding principles, clear and effective communicator, uh, problem solving, um, the gui those guiding principles. 
But also, in addition to that, the local agency can also set additional requirements for graduation as well. That's always been part of the state. <coughs> Interesting, um, another difference between the current law and this law is that students must be allowed to gain proficiency through multiple pathways. We need to offer some of choices for students in how they learn, but also we also must allow them to demonstrate <coughs> their proficiency in multiple types of ways. So they will have multiple opportunities and means by which they can demonstrate their learning. <coughs> Our rationale behind this extension, we need the additional time. Uh, we need the additional time in short because we want to do the job well. We want to make sure that um, we, the changes we create improve student learning, and we want to make sure that our students, when they leave Scarborough High School, are college and career ready. Also, the availability of our resources really is determining the rate at which we can move ahead. <coughs> so what this application includes is our current status. Our strength certainly is the 18-month improvement strategy. Now 24 months because we're moving, we're slowing down our improvement efforts given limited resources, but also our challenges. And our challenges is adequate resources. If you recall, and as I cited within the application, uh, we've gone through several years of significant um, economic challenges in which we lost 41 positions. We've been regaining and making improvements. And while our resources have increased, that rate of increase, we're still behind and behind other school systems in terms of what we offer K-12. The application also includes systems of support for students, and we do have systems of support for students under our current system, um, but we're under review and development. As we become clear about what those proficiency, uh, proficiencies are, we're going to examine those pieces as well. The application also includes our plan moving forward, which is the 24-month improvement plan complete with metrics, uh, as well as um, a budget in terms of how we will spend the state funds. The state funds are approximately $30,000 a year, and we're going to be using those funds in a variety of ways uh, for funding we don't have within our current budget in order to help us move forward with this initiative. Uh, we're focused on a learning system, not just a standards-based system, and it's student-centered. We certainly want to meet all the statutory requirements. We're not looking to avoid those with this extension. We just want to do it well. We have um, members of our leadership council. We've identified a professional learning team of uh, school leaders and district leaders, and we're focused on best practices in student-centered learning. And again, this is all focused on getting great value for every dollar we spend in terms of making those changes and recommendations during budget time. For example, we're going to be looking at model schools, we're, looking at, we're going to be looking at what works for students and doing that in the most cost-effective manner and then recommend those changes and begin to make those changes within our school systems, K through 12. Um, the Leadership Council felt that it would be unfair to suddenly expect when students walk in the door freshman year to have a completely different system. So we're going to be working on a K through 12 system there. Also within this application is documentation that this application has been reviewed by the board and certification via the school board uh, chair's signature on this. And we certainly need to share with the state what date and time that we've um, had this conversation. Are there questions that I might be able to answer or Mr. Creech or Ms. Hathorne? All right, I'll start down by Jackie. I have several, so is that okay? The first one is, uh, I noticed that it says that it has to, you just mentioned the date and time that the board has approval, but it is not on our agenda as an action item. Yeah, it's that, you, that's a good catch, uh, Ms. Perry. It should be, it is an action item for you tonight. It will, tonight, because it's, it says it's the basically, or, or, I mean, in some ways, the, the board can just, um, by consensus, agree that the, the chair will certify that that is our application. Uh, well, then later on I will move that we add it as, a, that, that would be as an that would be action fine. item. Thank yeah. you. Uh, secondly, on, on the information that we, we received with our packet, mm -hmm. on, on page, top of page four it says something about we need more money in, in order to ac 
accomplish this? And my question is, why does money or lack of it impact our ability to be proficiency-based? Uh, several, uh, for example, uh, if we are making changes in the high school schedule in order to provide students multiple opportunities for learning, that shift in schedule may require additional staff. Uh, for example, okay. one of the things That's that we've shared, and we've shared, yeah. we've shared with the board is that many students now want to take courses, but we don't have sufficient staff to, to um, run courses. Okay. That's fine. I, that's why I asked the question. Uh, my next question is, uh, what you know? You, you mentioned the requirements for proficiency, but what happens with the state requirements uh, on art, physical education, languages, social studies? How how do our children? How do our students meet the proficiency piece? And then or perhaps the state is relaxing their requirement no, on... not at all. Okay. <laughs> not at all. Those are uh, art, uh, health and PE, foreign languages, uh, fine arts are all content areas within the system of the learning results. There are eight content areas. Correct. And so the state is requiring <coughs> that our students show proficiency in those areas as well. They don't articulate how much time needs to be spent. For example, that first part of the law talk is very explicit about shall be involved in learning experience for each of the four years that students are in, for each of the years that students are in high school, not necessarily four years. But for fine arts, uh, foreign languages, health PE, there's no time requirement there, but they certainly need to meet proficiencies, which, which is a challenge given um, their recommended levels of proficiencies that we're seeing coming out from the state. That, that to me, that is the would be the biggest challenge to try and meet all of those requirements and then still become proficient in the four areas that are absolutely required for whatever certification a student is going to receive for accomplishing. Yes. We're not going to call it a diploma any longer. Is that that's my understanding? It will still be called a diploma. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. And nice presentation, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I got a question. Um, from the proficiency-based diploma, how is that going to be different? Right now we have a system that kids get a grade, and if you fail you know, below a certain grade, that class didn't pass. That means when they pass, they kind of, I assume they are proficient with that, you know, with the knowledge that's been learned in that, you know, taught in the class. So how, why would it be so different that the proficient basis versus what do we have now? Uh, in, in, in a proficiency-based system, there are certain standards that students need to meet. So when students are involved in a learning experience, for example, taking a language arts class, there will be certain standards that students need to meet. If they meet those standards in a true proficiency-based system, they would be able to accelerate and move ahead and focus on the next set of standards in that learning progression. Right now, students demonstrate their proficiency. There are many students who sit in our classes and they've kind of got it or they get it very quickly. And so they're there in that course, they're passing that course, and there's some downtime there. In a proficiency-based system, students would be able to move ahead working on those next sets of standards. Likewise, if a student is struggling in meeting of those standards, and that's the supports piece as well, is we would provide some interventions and some additional help for those students so that they can meet those standards. So it does, it's not as um, neat and simple in terms of putting 24, 25 students in a classroom for a period of time. It may look very different. What it might look like in terms of specificity, we're still working on that. We're looking at different models. We hope to be visiting some schools, talking to some folks who are trying different strategies in trying to deliver education in this way. So going further, so this doesn't divide students into who's up, who are going to, who is proficient, who is not. It's, not yeah, this, this is one layer, but the, within the people who are proficient, we still have the old system, you know, who is going to do better, you know, still have this grading. Because I know we've been, last year, we've been testing some like one to four standard. It's, I mean, so it's kind of doesn't differentiate the student from, you know, someone who is going to be, you know, from, a minus to A, 
So is that still going to be, you know, we still couldn't maintain that old system, or it's going to be completely over ramped to, you know, say, you know, we, we either provision or not, or how? We haven't figured out the details of h how it w that will look like. Um, there will still be grades in terms of communicating student progress. Whether that looks like a zero to 100, a one through four, or an A, B, C, D, attached to some description of performance, I'm not sure yet, or a combination of those pieces. I'm not sure yet. What we want to make sure in this system is that we're grading for learning uh, and that we're reporting the information that parents understand in terms of knowing where their child is and what their strengths are and what the areas they need to work on. So we, it, it, it's a challenge because we certainly don't want, in some of these standards-based report cards, we certainly don't want 16 pages of standards. And for me, I say, this report card's got to fit on the refrigerator door. Um, and so it really needs to communicate um, to the student, but also to the parents in the community, is my child doing all right? You know, there's an understanding piece. So the communicating student progress, sometimes a report card, sometimes a transcript as well, all of those pieces we need to make sure that they do indeed communicate, they communicate well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, Donna, before I go, oh, going in we have another question. Mm -hmm. Donna? Yeah, um, so is, is the two years the maximum the state will allow us to add on? Yes. It is. And all the extensions are, are all the extensions options are two two years. So it's not that we opted for two. Okay. All of the extension options are two years. Okay. And this is a huge overhaul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. Um, this is enormous, folks. Um, this is a, gi a gigantic change in in an awful lot of different areas. And I'm wondering the thirty thousand a year. Will that be available to us right up until How long? The seventh grade as a senior? Uh, that's my question as well. I haven't gotten an answer from the state. Uh, we know that uh, we have the funding. Uh, this year we were quite conservative with the funding um, because we wanted to make sure that our plans were well formed and the money is well spent. Uh, and my understanding is it will be available next year. I don't know after that. Okay. Because, to, to my mind, <coughs> to do this kind of professional development mm -hmm. is going to take many, many hours after the school day. Mm -hmm. It can't be done during teaching time. It, it's got to involve everyone K-12. Absolutely, and in mm -hmm. an effort to maximize the time we have with staff towards that end, um, many of these initiatives within within this application or our plans are right in line with our 24-month improvement strategy. So mm -hmm. the work that you may have heard um, that we're doing around Marzano and the learning of those pieces folds right in. Right. It's about learning goals, establishing learning goals. It's mm -hmm. about effective teaching practices. It's about empowering students to take responsibility for their learning. So all of those pieces, um, including the professional learning teams, will help us move in that direction. May I ask another? Oh, I'm just, sorry. Just a couple of quick ones. Go ahead. Is it still till age 21 that students will have to prove proficiency in all these areas? Uh, I would need to double check. I believe. I thought it's till 20. 20. 20. So kids can go to school till they're 20, and and have access to the public school systems in order to complete the proficiency. I, I believe think so, that, but I don't I'd think have anything to has changed about aging yeah. out. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just let the last one go. Go ahead. You had one more question, Jackie. I do, but there were others at the other side who, who have questions as well, so. I can come back to you if you'd like. All right, I have a question. How about that? Um, my question would be, you mentioned a couple of times that we're all trying to meet proficiency and you're going to go out and look at other 
places that are doing this. Are they within our state? Any of the schools that we discuss in our cohort or in our general area? Some of them are. Some of them, for example, we're taking part in some professional development opportunities where there's some um, examples or models of pieces of the system. But we're also looking outside the state because we want to make sure that we keep the focus on the changes that we're exploring. We want to ensure that they improve student learning. And uh, I think we need to start by looking at high-performing schools and seeing what are we <coughs> doing, and then pick and choose those practices that might help us on our journey. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Kelly. I guess I would just like some clarification about how kids will progress through, through the grades. Because theoretically, if it's going to be K-12 to proficiency, there could be someone say in seventh grade who has reached all the standards and really are in Algebra 2, we'll say, mm -hmm. do they go to the high school and take classes? Or, you know, if they're the only one at the middle school in seventh grade or in eighth grade even that has reached that level because they have proven proficient in all the lower, you know, they've passed all the way, how, how's that going to work? And can, will kids be finishing high school early? Could that happen? Uh, if students meet proficiency, they well may graduate from high school early and move on. Uh, we have students who graduate early now. Right. Uh, the, in terms of managing where students are, if they're following their own path piece, it, it all depends. For example, there are, uh, for example, at the high school, we now offer uh, VHS courses, online courses in which students who cannot access a course within the high school program of studies might access that. So it may be some sort of blended learning opportunity, or we may make arrangements for that student to take a course at the high school, for example. With our size, we're in, uh, in terms of over 3,000 students in the district. We are in a um, much better um, place in terms of not having too many of those singletons of students, um, where smaller districts might indeed have that and not they'd be harder pressed to program for those students. Uh, but if it were a group of students, uh, the students might go to the high school or the high school teacher might come to where the students are or the, a staff person at that uh, phase level or within that building might deliver the content that those students need. I'm just trying to picture all the logistics of it and it's mind-blowing the number of permutations and possibilities of where anyone could land on a spectrum and where, I mean, no two kids would have this be at the same place at the same time. I mean, it could happen that way. Theoretically, Theoretically, yes. but we're saying Theoretically, it's a bigger yes. district. Yeah, all, all students go through pretty similar developmental stages, um, but theoretically, absolutely. Jody? I just have a couple questions. It sort of piggybacks on what Kelly said. How does the student who, say, is a freshman or sophomore when the, the change actually happens, how does that affect their grading? And I know we keep focusing on grading because that's sort of our mentality and it's just a way of thinking that we need to change, but say I'm going along and I'm getting 95s, 97s, whatever, and then all of a sudden the switch happens to you're now proficient. How does that look on their transcript or for colleges? How does it affect well, them? Two, two separate things you're raising. One is how we transition to this system. It may not be just because it impacts a particular class. We may be running dual systems while students uh, matriculate out. Okay. Um, that's one possibility. We have not yet discussed how we transition and the implications on our systems. Uh, in terms of colleges, uh, homeschool students who don't have grades have a higher acceptance rates to colleges than students from schools. And so colleges are very good at reading, deciphering transcripts, uh, and there have been some schools, who, some colleges who have been looking at a variety of different transcripts and standards-based transcripts. So I think that is going to shift, um, but certainly it is our concern. We want to make sure that our Scarborough High School graduates are marketable to colleges or careers. Right. So th the communication via the transcript is a significant concern of ours. And then my only other question, is there a potential that the application gets rejected? 
I think what would happen is if the Department of Education has questions for us, we may, they would ask us and we may need to provide more information to them. I, that's the impression I get in terms of the process. Okay. Or Monique and I may make a visit up there. <laughs> <laughs> George wants which the opportunity, be, I think. <laughs> which might be more effective. Thank you. Chris. A uh, couple quick questions. You mentioned that the state is giving us $30,000 a year. Um, is that enough? Doesn't sound like it compared to the changes we have to do. It, um, in terms, my, one of my greatest worries is, a, um, is an application to manage and track student progress. Um, our, we've been testing and maximizing our current systems to do that, uh, but very often with an, if we're adding another system on, we're already maxed in terms of human resources, in terms of managing those systems and getting those up and running. Uh, <clears throat> but those costs associated with that, so for example, although that's $30,000, our recent application we brought on board had a one-year startup cost of $20,000. So these state monies, while they are appreciated, I don't know that I'm just hopeful that we're going to be able to live within those. Uh, I, I'm just not sure yet in terms of implications. Uh, the other question I had was, is, is two years going to be enough time to implement these changes? I mean, it sounds like we've, we haven't really gotten the ball really rolling. I mean, we're starting to do multiple things on multiple levels, but it sounds like we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And is two years going to be enough time? Uh, that is a question. It, it, it depends on how well we want to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, if we really want to do it well, we probably need a little bit more time. Uh, we've been implementing some changes. The middle school went through a significant scheduling change and shifting change, and they're working through that piece. Uh, <clears throat> and the high school, as a rather large, you know, a third of the student population are at the high school, so there will be some significant shifts that will need to happen there, and there well may be some implications, uh, for example, in terms of staffing. I know from my experience when most of the students who have senior privileges leave school, if we had all those students in school taking courses, we just don't have the staffing to provide the, the courses. Now add proficiency-based and add um, choices and multiple um, opportunities to learn and add multiple means of demonstrating and uh, it, it's going to get rather large rather quick. But as it states now, the state's going to mandate the adoption in two years, right? Yes. At this point in time, the state is requiring school districts, the, the extension um, is two years. Um, that's the given. Uh, last question. Um, if, if kids are kind of at different levels, and we're, we're, we're talking really right now about their aptitude and their, their ability to, to understand content and things, how do you deal with varying maturity levels if you've got a uh, on both sides if you've got a student who excels you now have a younger student participating in a group of potentially older kids and vice versa if you have a student who's not progressing as rapidly as others they might be in a group that's a little bit younger than them. how are you going to in a uh, that will be part of the responsibility of the classroom teacher to create a climate and a culture that is inclusive uh, but that is one of the challenges, for example, in gifted education where we have students who may be reading, they may be in second grade, but they may be reading at the high school level. Well, there are certain texts, given where that child is, socially and emotionally, that would not be appropriate for that child to read. So, yes, we, we may run into those situations as well. We're just going to have to be careful and craft the instruction for each individual child. <clears throat> I just had one question that piggybacks on what Chris said. If there were to be a change in administration in Augusta and all, you know, a big turnover, and if this was no longer the law, mm -hmm. would this be in the best interest of our students and our district to proceed? If it was no longer the law, would we still This is why we are taking go forward a with this? slow, thoughtful approach and we're focusing on student-centered learning because we want to ensure that the systems, structures, practices, and processes we put in place improve student learning and make sure that our students graduate college and career ready. So that's why we, we're requesting this extension. We want to make sure it works well. If the law disappears, we're still going to move forward because 
the 24-month improvement strategy is what we're working towards mm -hmm. because it's what the community has asked us to do. I, I'd like a chance to answer that question. Um, I, I think that the short answer is yes, we would still move in that same direction. We want kids to be able to uh, demonstrate what they know. They want, we want kids to learn content and then apply that in novel situations and solve problems. Um, would we do it in the same way that the state imagines organizations to change? Absolutely not. So we've continued to be very thoughtful about being student-centered, um, very thoughtful about developing the quality of instruction that's happening in every classroom. And I would say that I, I heard Mr. Caso say something about, you know, um, are, are we really prepared? I would say that we are as prepared as any school district may be better prepared because we're building a solid foundation of what's essential to move to that level of student-centered learning by really focusing on improving the quality of the instruction that's happening. And that has been a steady, um, steady and very strong focus for us for at least the last three years. So. Back down to the other. Uh, actually, I see um, Kristen has a question. Oh, yes. Concern. Well, I'll let Kristen go first. The concern I think I have with this is part of the non-proficiency-based learning kind of that's going on now is I see it as a, like a repetition. Like I know in pre-calculus you'll learn about sine and cosine and trigonometry. And we go over that for months because it's so important to get that hammered into your brain because when you take calculus, when you take physics, you need to know those off the top of your head and be able to spit them out. And with a proficiency-based thing, yes, two weeks into learning about those trigonometric functions, I may have been able to pass a test on them, mm. but would I have really grasped that full understanding and that full knowledge? I'm not Good sure. Question. Your concern is well-founded, uh, and that is the piece that will be our greatest challenge is what do we mean by proficiency? Um, and it may not mean the same amount of time for all, but we want to make sure that when we say a child is proficient, it, you really are, and that you, it will carry forward into your next coursework or when you need that information next. So that's a well-founded concern. Concerns us as well. Thank you. All right. You guys, you were all finished. Anyway. We rest. Thank you. All right. So we'll go back down <laughs> to Jackie. Thank you. Uh, this is something that you have heard me say ever since you've had this position, and it's mastery. You've used the term, and I have always been concerned when a student has learned the concept, for example, of addition and subtraction. Why do they have to be taught that same concept for five years when they're in school? Whether you know, it might be now two digits or three digits, but have they mastered the concept? Have we substituted proficiency for mastery? It's mastery, yes. But it's also, can the child apply that knowledge as well? And that will, be, that will be a demonstration to us as to whether or not it's mastered, and not just once. You know, in, in, if you can apply something a number of different times in different ways, that really is a stronger message that you have mastered that, truly mastered that, than just, yeah, I pretty much got it, and I can just recall that information um, on I a can use it. quiz. Yes, absolutely. You need to use it. Thank you. Donna. For all our parents out there, what do you foresee as a way in which you will help parents understand <laughs> gradually <laughs> over time? I imagine the, the, the kinds of changes this is going to bring. Well, it, for me, if we were doing this well, Students would be coming home describing what their learning goals are, what they're looking to learn, how they're learning, what their strengths are, and what they're working on in terms of their learning. So in some respects, if we're doing this well, the students would be educating the parents mm -hmm. at how effective the learning in school is for them um, moving forward. Um, that's one piece of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would also need to support parents in understanding why we're creating some of these changes and how these changes that we're creating will help all students. Mm. So 
it will be it will require ongoing communication. Mm -hmm. Chris, as you're talking, Monique, it brings up the the, the a, a question, I guess, of um, we we've been talking about shifting. Um, performance from, like, say, the SAT to a different type of testing mechanism, are we still going to have that testing structure in place to measure us against other, other districts or other regions? Yes. So this is going to be in addition to that standardized testing format? Yes. Uh, but understand that testing goes on in schools all the time now. It'll no, just look different. No, no, clear. But it, it, it sounds like when you were talking about having to show different ways of showing proficiency, mm -hmm. Um, and then we're talking about recall as well or, or retention, it seems to me like that standardized testing is still playing the critical role in the performance evaluations, correct? Yes. Okay. Good All Anyone I can else? say is wow. <laughs> Anyone else? Seriously, it's, this mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful, but it's huge. Thank you very much, Monique. We appreciate your presentation this evening. Oh, no. And that concludes my, my report. Okay. So, are we making an adjustment to the agenda now? Um, we can do that, sure. We, Ms. Perry, would Ms. Perry, would you like to... Yes, I'd like to propose an adjustment to the agenda, please. Uh, pro probably be number, uh, what, 9.0? and then adjournment would be 10.0? Or would it be 8.6? Or would it 8. be 8.6? Correct? 8.6? Well, uh, whatever, because 8 point point whatever, 8.6 is fine with me. Let's put it as 8.6, and the agenda item would be to approve the two-year extension of our application to the Department of Education on the proficiency-based Diploma. Okay. Second. All right. We have a second. All in favor of making that adjustment to the agenda at this time? Seven plus two. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now moving on to the chair report. First off, I will begin by saying that with the beginning of school, the board's been very busy um, at the open houses. We attended all but one, and that was because we had a board meeting the same evening. What we were trying to do was to meet uh, parents, grandparents, guardians, et cetera, as they came into the buildings or out of the buildings um, to collect email addresses of those visitors who would like to receive communications from the school board. We had a very, um, I believe, successful drive, so to speak, and um, we'll be out there at some other events that are going on um, within the schools coming up, and we try to not bombard people with emails, so just several times a year, just to give updates on things that are going on, budget uh, information, et cetera. So um, if you see us out and about and we ask you for your email address, please know that we're not distributing distributing it to other organizations. We keep it just for ourselves, and we don't share it just as though the other organizations don't share with us. So. Do we know when those will be compiled? Uh, Kelly has them up in the office, and she's, you know, they're working on inputting I'm them. I'm just wondering if the first email from us could be an invitation to the um, ribbon cutting. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to okay. look into that. I'll, I'll check it out. Um, <laughs> okay. Then next I would like to welcome our newest stu student representative down to the right of me, uh, Emma Hartle. She's a junior over at the high school. Um, I know Emma for a number of years and her family, so welcome aboard, Emma. Um, feel free to ask questions, and um, that's what we're here for. I'll give you our information, and of course, you have Kristen, who's the senior representative, uh, who can help you along as well. Good, good, perfect. Well, welcome aboard. Um, the Wentworth pro project continues to be on schedule and under budget. Um, very pleased to say that. The parking lot is coming along, lights have been installed and are lit, curbing's being put in, and everything is working as it should. So again, we continue to be on schedule and under budget, so yay. And um, Dr. Entwistle mentioned previously that uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony will be held Saturday, October 18th at 1 p.m., just another reminder. Scarborough Education Foundation 
on that same evening, Saturday, October 18th, is having their third annual harvest celebration, which has been attended, I think, by most of us. Um, wonderful event starting at 6 p.m. at Bailey's. Tickets are on sale. You can go to the Scarborough Education Foundation's website. Um, this year, uh, the Time Pilots will be playing, so we've got a different type of music going on, so that ought to be a good time. Not gonna... uh, then we have the Maine School Board Association Fall Conference coming up. That's October 23rd and 24th in Augusta, which is a Thursday and a Friday, and I think everybody who was planning on attending was RSVP to Kelly Johnston to let her know um, if you were coming both days or just one day. So, And um, we're going to be having a session there um, with our student representatives uh, to help other school districts that are interested in having student representatives learn more about what we do here in Scarborough. So uh, we're excited for that. Um, and that concludes my chair report this evening. And now I'll look down at the other end for our student representative report. So this past week, the high schools had a successful Spear Week. Uh, all the students dressed up for different themes days throughout the week, and we earned points for our grades in a school-wide competition. Uh, the seniors won. Um, <laughs> and uh, we ended the week with the WGME Spirit Challenge on Friday, and we all arrived at the school at 6 a.m and had what is being called the best entrance to uh, the school. We had fire trucks, it was really awesome, we all ran inside. It was a lot of fun. And um, I believe we raised over $600 to support the Good Shepherd Food Bank um, that week alone, and we're gonna continue to collect canned goods and uh, monetary donations until the end of October. Um, and then the whole week was ended with the homecoming dance, which was on Saturday, which was put on by the junior class. And then also, just a little plug for the senior class, we are hosting a 5K road race on November 15th to support our class, and part of the proceeds will be donated to Project Grace. Um, it's going to be, it's planned to be around the municipal campus and school area, um, and we're going to have an online registration set up in the next couple of days on active.com, and uh, I would like to welcome and encourage all members of the community to uh, join us for that. There's going to be prizes for the winners, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. It's for its great cause. And I'd also like to welcome Emma to the board. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Does that conclude the students? It well, does. Thank you. All right. And we have our new business, 8.0. Uh, we'll start with 8.1. We have the minutes of September 4th, 2014. Move approval is printed. Second. Second. Any corrections? Comments, omissions, all in favor of approval as presented. Seven plus two. So moved. Uh, 8.2, the minutes of September 18th, 2014. Move approval as printed. Second. Comments, corrections, omissions. I am going to abstain from this particular one as I was not present at the meeting. I'll abstain as well. Okay. So we're down two. All right. Anybody else? All right. All in favor of approval as presented. We have five. And I'm two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so moved. 8.3, motion to adopt the 2014-15 school board goals and objectives that we had worked on at the board retreat, refined, and looked over. The move approval. Second. Anybody have any corrections or, oh, Chris? No, uh, no corrections, just a comment. Um, some of our goals do re require interaction with the other governing board in this town, so I'm hoping that we get their support and we can move forward. All right, anything else? All in favor of approval of the 2014-15 school board goals as presented. Seven plus two. So moved. And we have 8.4 budget transfers uh, for accounts that were overspent by more than $10,000. And we have Kate Bolton, our business finance manager, who's joining us this evening. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Um, We'll see as we get to the end of the presentation that there's actually two action items. One is for the budget transfers and the other is a separate one for the school nutrition program, as we have done in the past. 
but what I'd like to do first is just to walk you through, I will try to be brief because I know you've absorbed an awful lot of information this evening. I'll walk you through a little bit of a recap of the fiscal year 14 that was now closed out. And uh, I, as I said, I'll be brief, but if there's questions as we go along, if you want to hang on to those, I can uh, take some time with you at the end. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that I apologize for not getting this material out to you before the meeting. I uh, basically just finished it today, so uh, I will be sending it electronically so folks can save it. I know a lot of people like to do that. Um, and if there are questions after you've had a chance to pack through the material um, on the financial reports themselves, please feel free to let me know and I can speak to whatever, whatever comes to mind. So. Uh, quickly, as we run through, uh, after the ups and downs of fiscal 13, with the mid-year curtailment that we dealt with, uh, fiscal year 14 was a bit smoother sailing, despite some struggles to balance our resources with the appetite of Scarborough citizens to support tax increases, we were able to sustain some incremental advances in staffing and programming. On the challenges side, with the opening of the Baxter Academy, local school districts, including Scarborough, began to grapple with the impact of the state's new charter school funding formula. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the report. Although this isn't really my area of expertise, I'd like to take a minute to mention some things we were able to accomplish with the funds allocated to incremental new investments in FY14. We began the Jumpstart Summer Literacy Program for students entering kindergarten in the summer of 2013, and it proved to be a terrific model and informed some new teaching techniques that carried over into the school year. The middle school was able to add a half-time tech integrator to help teachers learn the ins and outs of the new HP student laptops, which were provided through the state's MLTI program. For the first time, sixth graders were also provided with laptops so that all middle school students would have the same access to technology in the classroom. Uh, the district-wide foreign language program was able to add a half-time teacher at the middle school as we worked to slowly implement a multi-year rebuilding process in foreign language. Wentworth and the K2s increased their math instructional coach support as they continued their implementation of the math and focus curriculum. And new building ed techs at the K2s increased access to academic support for students. And special services staff was increased to meet ever-changing student needs. Now to the money. As you'll probably recall from earlier discussions, we ended fiscal year 13 with a sizable undesignated fund balance for the first time in several years. On the financial statement you've received and the slides that follow here, you'll see that we've essentially maintained that surplus and added to it so that we're in a position to use the $800,000 of the fund balance that's already committed to support the FY 2015 budget. And this will still leave a balance of $453,657 to carry forward. And this is a very similar position to where we stood at the end of FY 12. This next slide is the summary financial statement. It shows the big picture movement in the general fund from the beginning to the end of FY14. You've got the detailed figures by category in the packets, and I've streamlined those a bit this time to show all the general fund operating expenses in the context of the voter categories, and I'm leaving out the old-fashioned breakout by department this time. We keep striving to simplify and clarify our reporting so it's more easily understood by the public, so I hope this will be helpful. At the same time, I've also moved adult education out of the general fund uh, reporting based on the latest DOE guidelines, and I've given it its own section of the financial statement. Uh, that's because the adult education program is actually held separate from the K-12 voter referendum. So I'm going to take a moment to point out a few items of note. Um, I promise I won't go line by line because I know you're, again, full of useful information this evening. Fiscal year 2014 revenue showed an overall surplus of $112,000 and change over budget projections. Revenues continued to fall a bit short in student activity fees and miscellaneous revenues. 
And the GPA shows a shortfall of $17,000, which is due to the State Department of Education's new policy of deducting funds from GPA to pay private special purpose schools. So that is uh, special education outside placement. Rather than having districts pay uh, in tuition a certain portion of the funding that comes from the federal government, the ascending districts are now having that deducted from their GPA. It means that our tuition bills from those schools are reduced on the expenditure side, so it's essentially a wash, but as you'll see later, we're still pl spending plenty in outside placements. We did better than we expected in state agency client reimbursement. Uh, during, due to changes in enrollment of eligible students, I think you'll remember this is kind of a tough area to budget since it relies on the status of a very mobile population, specific students who are eligible for that billing. And we also had a modest surplus in facility rentals. General fund expenditures came in under budget by just over $300,000. Although this represents only 0.86% of the fiscal 14 operating budget, it does show our commitment to managing within our approved budget according to our statutory obligation. The two main areas where savings were achieved were in facilities, where costs were be able to be held under budget for staffing, contracted services, and supplies, and also through personnel turnover and benefit enrollment changes across the district. As a side note about facilities, you'll see that I've credited good fortune, which isn't exactly an, a standard accounting term. My point here is that in facilities more than any other area, we hope for the best and plan for the worst knowing that the care of buildings involves a certain degree of crisis management and that energy costs have been so volatile, we've been very conservative about budgeting sufficient funds to address any needs that may arise in this area. Consequently, if all goes well, we're likely to have a savings at the end of the year. As you know, I'll be requesting an action item from you tonight to authorize budget transfers to balance individual expense accounts that have been overspent by $10,000 or more. These year-end budget transfers ensure that we take note of these accounts and can perhaps use the information to refine future budget development. As usual, wherever we have a deficit in one account, we have a surplus in another area to use to offset it. If you take a look at the two-page budget transfer document that I've left with you, that's the one with the pretty colors <coughs> that go sideways. You'll see that as in prior years, there are a number of account overruns in individual salary, wage, and benefit accounts due to personnel changes during the course of the year. In each, each case this year, the accounts that have run over budget can be offset by surplus in other wage and benefit accounts where for the same types of reasons we have excess budgeted funds. Then we've got a little more variety on the list this year in terms of other types of expenses with cost overruns. Running down through these quickly, other accounts on our budget transfer request include, first, special services tuition paid to outside schools, as I mentioned earlier, driven by the need to provide the appropriate educational setting for some of our students. Uh, we have sent those students outside our district and we are paying tuition. Um, in this case, we've paid more tuition than we expected to do in F FY14. And we're uh, proposing to offset that with savings in a special ed benefits line. Next is athletics, contracted services, where we made the decision to fund a larger portion of ice and pool time than was budgeted, shifting that away from support that had previously been provided by booster clubs. We've proposed to offset this with a savings in the IT staff line, which is due to delayed hiring for an open position. Then in district legal fees, where we've sought assistance with some complex collective bargaining issues, we're considerably over budget, uh, over $73,000. We're offsetting this with savings in a couple of system administration accounts, as well as two facilities lines. Some other accounts in need of attention are, Wages for spare bus drivers, which as we saw last year ran over budget due to a combination of staff turnover and increased demand for transportation services outside the regular school day, both for special services and for athletics and activities. 
Again, a repeat from last year's list is the bus repair vehicle parts line, where we're still catching up on a replacement cycle for our aging fleet. We did purchase three buses in FY14, and we have three more coming this fall, so we're making some headway. But the size of our town and the current demands on the transportation department has us pushing these vehicles to their limits, and breakdowns can be quite a challenge. We're proposing to offset both of these overruns with savings in the regular bus driver wage and benefit lines and in the bus fuel line. Natural gas is a new addition to the budget transfers list. You may remember last year we saved around $100,000 on natural gas, which was a significant driver in our high year-end surplus for FY13. In FY14, we've done a 180 because our favorable locked-in price contract expired in November of 2013 and gas prices have skyrocketed. Uh, we've locked in a new price agreement, which is better than current market pricing, but it's still at a significantly higher cost per BTU, and that combined with a cold winter last winter pushed these accounts well over budget. Conversely, we still had a favorable contract in place for electricity so that along with continued work to transition to energy efficient fixtures, that gives us a budget surplus to offset the natural gas expense and along with some savings in facilities, contracted services, and repairs. Finally, we have the charter school impact, which I've given its very own slide, kind of an empty slide with a lot of words behind it. Uh, when we built the FY14 budget, charter schools were still a work in progress at the state level, and we had very little guidance to go on as far as estimating the financial impact to our own district. As the school year opened, the Baxter School in Portland was approved and we ultimately had seven Scarborough students enroll there. As you know from other conversations, Scarborough pays a DOE determined tuition for each student that attends a charter school. When the budget was built, we placed some additional funds in the same account we use for vocational school tuition, which is Paths and Westbrook uh, back in the good old simple days but we were later instructed by the DOE to set up a number of new charter school accounts. Uh, this makes the year-end reporting a bit of a challenge because the pieces moved, uh, but the long story short is that the vocational assessment account was left with a $65,000 budget overrun, and we're proposing to offset that with a variety of available funds from regular instruction and facilities. So the charter school funding obligation and the enrollment fluctuations will now need to be part of my regular check-ins with the school board finance committee, since obviously this will continue to have a significant impact as we go forward. This slide shows in very tiny letters a summary of expenses in FY14 expressed in the 11 voter categories developed by the state. This is the new format I mentioned earlier, using the traditional financial statement structure, but showing the expenses by category instead of building or department. And if this is tough to read on the screen, it is in the packet. It's in the handout, uh, page four of the year-end financials report. At the top is what you're really looking at on the screen here. So when we talk about district to district comparisons during budget conversations, per pupil expenditures, those kind of figures that we throw around, these are the categories that are used in state data tables. So uh, these are the, the figures that we're relating to uh, the communities around us. In this slide, the expenditure percentage for each category is, is shown along with the same figures for uh, the past two fiscal years as a point of comparison. This one I know you won't be able to see, because I can't even see it, um, but it's in the packet. Uh, this is the third page of the budget transfers packet, which is the pretty sideways one, again. Uh, sorry, it's teensy. This is page three of the budget transfer handout, and what this one does for us is it shows uh, a summary of the requested transfers that you folks will be voting on um, and how they break out between categories. According to state statute, during the year for which the budget is approved, using the cost center summary budget format, the school board may transfer an amount not exceeding 5% of the total appropriation for any cost center to another cost center or among other cost centers without voter approval, which means that we can make these transfers, 
but the idea is to limit them because the voters of Scarborough have told us we want to spend the money in these categories. So it's, uh, the statute is to prevent districts from sort of willy-nilly deciding to throw all their money from special ed into guidance or whatever other random exciting thing we might want to do. So uh, this is something that the auditors look at. The Department of Ed looks at it every year uh, when they receive our financials. And uh, it's something that they hold us to. As you can see, we haven't transferred more than 5% out of any category. It is a bit of an arbitrary distinction, but it helps the public to see the kinds of school services that are provided by the district and paid for with local taxes. Although our main focus is on the general fund, this year-end financial packet also includes figures on adult ed, as we talked about earlier, on school nutrition, grants and trusts, federal restricted funds, which means Title I, Title II, local entitlement, aid to special education. Separate year-end status reports are also in the packet, bless you, bless you. Uh, included for multi-year CIP projects and one for the Wentworth Building Project. A couple of quick points of interest here in the um, grants and trusts. You'll see the financial statement reflected an extremely generous new legacy of $150,000 given to us by Lewis and Tina Feinberg, um, which the board gratefully accepted this past year. And these funds are earmarked for use in expanding access to the arts for Scarborough students. And another new item this year is a grant from the State Department of Ed to assist local districts in the development of proficiency-based graduation requirements, which is a subject you've just heard quite a bit about. And again, as Monique mentioned, that's about a $30,000 grant, uh, which we first received in FY14, and we're permitted to carry that forward and hopefully receive a little bit more. I've put in an uh, individual slide about adult ed. As I mentioned earlier, the state's now requesting that adult ed programs not be included in the general fund financials, so we've separated out the program costs and revenues on the year-end statement and you'll find that now on page two of the Statement of Surplus, which is, oh dear, let's see, that's page five of the full packet. You'll see that while expenditures were over budget, tuition has seen a significant jump due to some exciting new course offerings, and you've heard a little bit about this during the course of the past year. Um, we're particularly proud of adding some professional and workplace training courses like the CNA program, medical assistant. They've proven extremely popular. Um, we're getting some uh, additional fees for those classes and we're really serving the community in a, in a great new way. Uh, we're also eligible for more subsidy as a, redu as a result of uh, creating that programming. And uh, there's some grant opportunities which our uh, adult ed director has tapped into. So uh, even though we spent a little bit more on wages and materials, we recouped that and more and ended the year uh, with about $20,000 in fund balance for adult debt. Next comes school nutrition. And we have had many, many conversations about the value of our school nutrition program, the excellent results they're achieving with student health and wellness, and also about the impacts of the new USDA regulations, which have led to increased food costs waste, loss of revenue on popular food items. And knowing that the school lunch program will, be con will continue to be faced with challenges and restrictions such as these and committed as we are to ensuring the health and well-being of our students, we will no doubt once again be discussing more realistic support of this program in the coming budget season. In the meantime, this, uh, this evening there will be a vote requested to cover the fiscal 14 deficit of 197,278 with a transfer from the general fund. So to look forward for just a moment, a few things that are coming up, and I always feel like I have a foot in two years and sometimes I have an extra foot in the third year, and uh, now, I, now I'm back to, to the present day. As the new Wentworth building has come online, I've been working with the project managers to refine the monthly expense reporting and get a handle on the remaining expected costs. Technology, furnishings, and paving are still in process along with a few remaining items on the construction list. 
At this point, it looks as though the bonded funds for the project will be within a few thousand dollars of actual expenses, and any excess bond proceeds will be applied to pay down debt service. And as Christine said, it's on time and under budget, which is our favorite sentence. Um, we'll continue to report out to the steering committee at each of their meetings. They meet uh, still every month or six weeks or so. And we'll caref carefully monitor additional costs as things begin to wind down. It would be my anticipation that we would have some form of public uh, report out when we get to the end of that uh, as well. Fiscal year 15, first quarter financials. We just finished the first quarter of 15, as I'm standing here talking about last year. Um, those will be provided to the Finance Committee at their next business meeting, and then we'll distribute those out to the full board. Um, next bullet, the auditors will be in town. Uh, they'll start work with us on October 14th. Uh, we'll spend the week here at school and town hall and uh, many emails after that. Um, and we really don't anticipate that they'll finish their work until the end of December. The usual pattern is that they come and spend some time with us and then they go away and ask a lot of questions and then the, re the final report comes in December. Uh, but I don't anticipate any massive changes in these, in these figures. Although it, it seems like we never stopped talking about budget development, we did take a minute off this summer but now we're back in conversations with school leaders, the board, the town manager, and the town council finance committee about potential improvements to the budget process for fiscal year 16 with the goal of increasing community involvement and understanding of the school budget and more effectively articulating the connections between our goals for student learning and our requests for resources. So my last slide is the action items we're requesting tonight. I don't think my language is exactly what the language of the uh, motions turned out to be, but I believe Mr. Chiazzo will provide you with those appropriate motions. And if you have questions at this point that I can respond to, I'm um, um, right here. Uh, before we take board questions, I do notice that there are public uh, Mm -hmm. in the audience. So if there's anyone from the public wishing to speak on this particular topic, I'd open that up to public comment. Please step to the podium. State your name, address. We've got three minutes. He's my timekeeper. <laughs> Michael Turek, 11 Bayberry Lane, Scarborough. Uh, I'm brand new and shiny at this, so pardon my ignorance. Uh, the action item is to request approval of transfer of $197,000 and some change from the general fund to the surplus, or surplus to cover food services. Uh, I don't know where the general fund is. Is that this undesignated fund balance of $450,000? Is that where this $197,000 is coming from? Kate, please. Um, actually, the $197,000 If we go back to this one here, the statement of surplus, you'll see that one of the line items is fiscal year, year-end adjustments. It's the third line up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So we actually make that adjustment before we get to the bottom and say, this is what we have left as undesignated surplus. So the 197 then is part of the 800. Uh, no, the 197 is deducted from the 1.4 million that we had at the end of the year. Uh, so so the, the 1.4 million mm -hmm. is we're all done with fiscal 14, and right. this is what we've got in the bank. But we do need to account for school lunch. And, it, and by statute, we are required to cover that school lunch deficit. We cannot leave it in deficit. Um, so we take the 197,000, and there's another little adjustment in there. We're actually putting some fund balance back, so it's not the same number that you'll hear. Uh, but it's on the financial statement. And once we get that out, we have 800000 that we've promised to fiscal 15, and the bottom line is what we have not promised to anything. That's what undesignated surplus is. Okay. 
No, I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, one other question. Are we can you can you step to the microphone because oh, yeah. the people in the public won't right. be able to hear. Uh, this 197, 197,000 we had to make an adjustment for. Does that mean that when the board gets together to look at the budget for the next year, is will this kind of thing be taken into consideration and added into the budget? We try every year to take it into consideration, and typically it ends up, we call that one of our budget reconciliations. So if you're not familiar with that no, particular point, um, each year we have a list of budget reconciliations that we would like to make, and uh, we put those forward when we come out with our new proposals and all the other things that we come forward with with the budget. And typically um, school nutrition doesn't necessarily get reconciled. but it needs to be because it's money that we have recognized in the past that is spent on the nutrition program. And um, we've had this conversation with the auditors and we've had this conversation around many tables. And um, it really should be, but that's always the thing that gets pulled out in the end. So thank I don't you. know if Kate wants to add anything to that. Or no. that thank you. Uh, I understand more than when I walked in the door. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak on the budget issues here that we're discussing tonight? Seeing no one else, I will close the public comment section and I will ask if there are any questions from the board. So did, all right, we'll give him the last conversation if he has anything to say. No, I just Jeff have first. one question for <laughs> clarification for all of us in the public. When will we close out the Wentworth account? Well, um, right now we don't have all the bills paid. No, I understand that. Um, Is it going to be June 30th, 15, or? I, I see, yes. I think that that's actually completely correct. I think that the, the Wentworth project will stay open, like most CIP projects do, until the end of the fiscal year, at which point we'll assess where we are, and if we are done done, we will close that, that project. And that was my question. Mm. Uh, because we have to wait until our guarantees and all of that business, and yeah, well, there's so, work. So there's we work have a retainage, underway. right? The, the pu public, who's if you're familiar with construction projects, we hold back money until we make certain that all of the systems are working as they're supposed to work before we pay that last bill. But I didn't know whether it would be fiscal 15 or fiscal 16, whether we were going to do another full year before we closed out that account. I would I've been asked. Yeah, and I, I would be surprised if we needed to go into fiscal 16. I wouldn't say that that couldn't possibly arise, um, because we do have multi-year CIP funds that, you know, obviously not a huge building project like this, but um, it is permitted to carry forward CIP Correct. projects until they're done. But the way the timetable's been working and, you know, knocking on whatever wood I've got somewhere, uh, <laughs> the way everything's been going, I don't see any reason why we couldn't close it by June 30 of 15. No, and I don't either. My question was just for public information. Thank you very much. Anyone else questions? Oh, sorry, Donna. It's okay. No, I looked that way right. too fast. Thank you. <laughs> Um, is, is the current uh, Wentworth project reflected in current taxes that citizens are paying? That's an interesting question. It's one that I think that uh, we've had some uh, advice from the town that it wasn't in, uh, it wasn't in uh, having any impact on current taxes. Mm -hmm. So I know that it did not have any impact in fiscal 14. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not really in control of that piece of things, of, of setting the tax assessment or doing the bonding, um, whether it has an impact in fiscal 15, but I believe that's something that the steering committee is looking into. Uh, the original advice that we got was that it was not going to have any impact. And you got that from the town? From the town from when the we town. were first doing the bonding, yes. Okay. Uh, how many how many students do we currently have in out of district placement that are not in a charter school? Oh, I know the answer to the charter school one, but I don't know the uh, answer to the special services one right off the top of my head. Um, 
I know we have ongoing tuition bills to a number of special purpose schools, uh, but I couldn't really tell it's you the a, number. It is not a big. It is not a big number. It's not a big number, but, but, no. but it any is number, a big number. Any number increases it fairly significantly, though. Right. But it is not a large number. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to. I would say. Ten. Less than twenty, maybe. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, ten, twelve, but uh, I'm guessing. So not a big number in the number of students, but a big number in the amount we have to pay for those students in out of district placements. That's correct. Exactly. Out of out of dis district placements are not going to another school district. It's going to a highly specialized school to meet a set of highly specialized needs mm -hmm. that cannot generally be met in mm -hmm. any public school. Public. Um, and we do a good job of meeting those needs. So. And can't be met in our joint efforts out in Buxton? Well, it, it may be, but we still oh, pay tuition one. for that. Uh, okay, yes. okay. We do pay tuition to the Sebago Alliance School. Oh, okay. um, we pay a reduced tuition because we're members of that alliance mm -hmm. um, as compared to other districts, but we still do pay for the services. Okay, thank you. Jody. Um, my question is about the benefits enrollment changes. Is mm -hmm. that a direct result of the negotiating the our negotiation team did with the different contracts to create that savings? That is a good question. Actually, this impact is not um, reflective of those changes because they haven't taken place yet in the numbers that we're looking at today. Um, the teachers' contract changes were uh, effective as of September 1st of 2014, and the support staff changes and the bus drivers, I believe, will be effective as of January 1st. So there's going to be a little bit of a lag there until we see the changes. The changes that you're seeing in the budget transfers are individual lines that may have one or two or three or ten people in them. So what you're seeing is the impact of someone making a change mid-year or after the budget's been passed in their own personal choice about what to do with insurance. And that could be, you know, my spouse loses his job, so now I have to have Scarborough insurance. I had a baby, so I'm going to add the baby to my insurance. Um, mm -hmm. These are the types of benefit changes that any employer will deal with all throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just reflective of the fact that, that those individual small accounts um, show a, a drastic change when one person does something differently in insurance. I think next year we'll be having a different conversation about I the impact so. of, uh, of the uh, collective bargaining changes. Right. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. Seeing no other questions, I uh, will look down that way. All right. Um, I'll present the motions to the board. Uh, the first motion is uh, move approval to authorize budget transfers for physical year 2014 accounts overspent by more than $10,000 per details provided to the school board by the business office for a total amount of $431,207, adjustments to be made in accordance with the budget transfers by account category worksheet that you all have. Second. Questions, comments? Nothing. Oops. Oh, yes, Mr. Um, I, I, I did want to give kudos to Kate because, again, we're, we're looking at a very small percentage of adjustments and a very large and complicated budget. So it does attest to her skills and the staff skills to be able to project and, and uh, determine what our needs are and, and continue to perform well above expectations. Kudos. Mm -hmm. Jackie. My question is, is very close to what we did last year. Yes, it, it is quite similar. I think there, um, in this particular list, there are a couple of outliers that we haven't seen before: um, the natural gas, the charter schools, and um, the uh, legal fees we had last year. So the sped outside placement we didn't have last year. So there's some places where we just had a weird year. Um, but in most cases, you're going to see the same types of things come up um, from one year to the next. I, I just want. I just want it known publicly that this is an ongoing process, an annual process. It is not unusual, and uh, we didn't have a party. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, I, it's it's an opportunity. It's a it's a board policy, and it's an opportunity for 
oh. everybody to take a closer look mm -hmm. at accounts where we didn't guess right. Yep. So uh, we might be able to guess more accurately in the future, or if we can't, then we know the reason why. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Then all in favor of approval of the motion made by Mr. Chiazzo as presented. Seven. Thank you very much. Uh, turn it back uh, to you again. Second motion. Uh, move approval to transfer $197,278 from the fiscal year 2014 general fund year-end fund balance to cover the school nutrition fund deficit. Second. Questions? Comments? I have one comment. Yet again, I would like to see this not occur every year, and I'm sure everyone else, uh, not only sitting here, but uh, everyone else up in other places would also like to see that happen. So uh, that being said, all in favor of approval of number two, the transfer of the school nutrition funds. Seven. Thank you very much. Kate. I guess then you would be directed to please make the transfers as mm -hmm. requested. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your hard work with that. We know that you spend countless hours uh, trying to make this understandable for all of us. So thank you very much. Then we have 8.5. We have appointments this evening, so I will turn this over to Dr. Entwistle. Um You have appointments for high school and middle school athletic and co-curricular appointments as presented. As well, you have Wentworth co-curricular appointments and Scarborough Central Certification Committee appointments. So you may wish to take them one at a time, but they are as were presented in your packet. Okay. <coughs> the will of the board this evening. Move approval as presented. Do we want to take it in chunks, or did we want to? I don't need to, <coughs> but if you wish, I will start Your with uh, oh. 8.5.1, high school and middle school athletic and co-curricular appointments as presented. Okay. Second. All right. Any questions, comments? I have one. Yeah, I, I, well, if you're going to, yeah. I have one. There is a correction that just needs to add a zero, I believe, under um, Oak Hill players Thomas set design. It just needs an another zero, I believe. Mm -hmm. The two dollars? Yeah, so like a two with a comma, two zeros. So if we can just, that's the only. I thought that was a saving, no? No, <laughs> that's not. That was, the comma was supposed to be there with an extra zero. So. Anything else? All right, seeing nothing else, <coughs> all in favor of approval of yeah, the... Oh, you have a question? question yeah. Okay, sure. Um, Didn't see your hand. Yeah, sorry. Um, is this all of the appointments for fall, or do we have more? That should be... It. it looks like a pretty comprehensive list. So that should be it, Jane. Yeah, there's just the one, the um, uh, to be announced, the um, high school math team that hasn't been filled yet it in the yellow? Yes. So that's the only one that doesn't have. I don't see any thing for the middle school, any math team from 6th to 8th grade. Hmm. So it's not all, it's uh, Well, this is just the high school. We're just dealing with high school right now. Okay. So this is high school, high school and middle, middle school. school and middle school. Oh, I'm sorry, high school and middle school. So there might be more coming. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All in favor of approval as presented, the high school and middle school athletics and co-curricular appointments. Seven. So moved. Uh, 8.5.2 is the Wentworth co-curricular appointments? I You've already? Seven. Okay. Any? Move approval. Thank you. Second. Okay. Questions? Comments? I just noticed one opening still for somebody, and it's a booster. Um, you'll see some asterisks next to some of those items. They're booster funded, so just so that people know. Question. Um, I, I remember when we had Lego Robotic Club last year, which 
and they don't, they're not having a this year anymore? I don't know if that one started at the beginning of the year. That was a what, midway. What club Lego was? Robotics. Wasn't that a midway through the year? I don't think that started till like the, the winter. Can I? Yeah, that oh, wasn't regular. So all of the clubs oh, have been uh, put on hold until they got into the school and got organized, and they're looking at starting them up probably in December or January. Okay. Right. So that's why it hasn't started up yet. Yeah, you yeah. know, there's lots of cops, yes, to see it. Right, they have to get into the school and then the spaces and so forth like that, and they're working on them, but there'll be some coming later. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else? All in favor of approval as presented? Seven. Thank you. And then we have 8.5.3, the Scarborough Central Certification Committee, SCCC. Move approval. Second. Question. Uh, can, can somebody explain to me what that is? I think I know what it is, but. We have to have a certification board um, in our district to approve plans for teachers to uh, go through the certification process. And so we have one person who oversees the district and then at each phase level they have uh, coordinators. And so the people who are a teacher who's going through certification goes, meets with this board, submits their work, and the board approves it before they send it to the state. So this money is state funded then, correct? This is uh, not coming out of an activities fund, fund or? Locally funded. locally funded, it's a state mandate. Locally funded, so it's, it, is it coming out of the activities and uh, activities budget or is it a separate, no. what part of the budget is it coming from, Kate? Do you, is it? Sorry. It comes from each individual building. Uh, each building has a stipend line where they pay uh, folks like lead teachers um, and uh, other building staff who are doing jobs that are above and beyond. So there are individual stipend lines in each building and that's where this, this money is funded. And as Joanne says, it's a, it's a requirement, but it's, uh, the state doesn't pay us to do it. Yeah, I just don't. I don't typically remember doing stipends for, for. Um, I think we, we've uh, had them for administrative or ac or, or academic types. We do mm -hmm. three okay. years, maybe. Okay. okay. So I think we've had the committee mandate. Is what years. we're saying. We've had is it four years? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They do really important work in terms of keeping certification on track. Yeah, I'm not questioning the, the validity of it. I'm just, I, it stood out to me as being something that's, I mean, typically we're looking at athletics or activities that are coming through on the stipend side of things. So let me just check it. Okay. Question, Jackie? Yeah. No, I have a question after this that I. Okay. All, all in favor of approval of the Scarborough Central Certification Committee as presented with two vacancies still open? Seven. Thank you. And. It's, it's not a financial question. It's one that I wanted to ask when Monique was up, and I don't expect an answer right now, but from probably from Mr. Creech at a later date. Uh, how is the, what is going to be the impact of working on uh, the high school accreditation and the proficiency, proficiency piece? Because I know that a high school accreditation uh, it takes a lot of work as well. So I, I just raised the question, not expecting an answer here. Okay, thank you. All right, then we have our addition, our 8.6 is to approve the two-year motion. to approve motion. the DOE application for oh. proficiency. Shall I say it? Sure, please. It's a motion to approve the DOE application for proficiency-based diploma extension. Okay. So move. Thank you. Second. Okay. Questions, comments? Excellent presentation again, Monique. Mm -hmm. So thank you. All in favor of approval of the, um, the application applic to extension <laughs> application. the extension <laughs> application for the high school proficiency based one. Seven. <laughs> okay. That was a mouthful. It's a okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so then we have n no new business. We have nine. Oh, actually, you know what we forgot? Uh, I need to add, sorry, I need to make a, a motion to add something else to our agenda this evening, and that would be our committee reports. So 
you don't want to make a committee report. <laughs> I have others, but I have others that would like to make committee reports down to the right of me. So can I, I, I make that motion? Who's going to second me? To Thank add you. committee reports, mm -hmm. second. Thank you. All in favor of adding that. Thank you, seven plus two. All right, Jackie, down by you first. Thank you. On uh, Tuesday evening, the Maine School Boards Association, Maine School Management Association, which includes school boards and superintendents, hosted a, a seminar, if you will, or an evening to meet and greet with people running for the legislature from this area. And it was held uh, at uh, the Gorham Middle School, and it was well attended. Uh, I was a little disappointed that two people running for the house from Scarborough were not there, but others were, and uh, from the from the region. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, it was well received by those people uh, from school boards and superintendents present, as well as candidates having an opportunity to address issues that have been raised by the superintendents and the school boards. And uh, as I say, it was uh, interesting. And uh, by all reports, people were glad that they were there. You've had the information coming to you already for the, uh, for the main school boards uh, convention at the end of the month. And uh, just recently, we had the uh, proposal, you received a proposal on on new legislation going forward. And uh, we will continue to work as we did last year with the Maine Education Association on uh, promoting education and, and bills that will enhance the education of the children of this state. So I just urge people to, on behalf of Maine school boards and Maine superintendents to, to be alert and to certainly get out there and vote at the appropriate time. Thank you, Jackie. Jane? Um, with the long-term non uh, facility planning um, committee, we'll have a meeting next Wednesday from 9 to 10 o'clock. And we have recently got more information from Harriman and Associates about um, some analysis and the um, proposed options for us to consider, so we are going to go over that as a community without the, um, without the, the Mr. Cecil here, but just as our, you know, um, internally and to see what questions and, uh, you know, we can um, just digest those and see what questions we have going forward and everybody else is in the bo um, board is uh, invited, so if you want to know what we're doing in the long-term facility planning and to try to find ways to provide, you know, quality education at a lower cost in terms of facility planning. So, oh, you're welcome to attend next Wednesday from 9 to 10. Thank you. Donna, teacher. Uh, communications. Um, we met a few times um, this September, and um, one of the things that we'll be planning to do is that on Election Day, we will have a table set up for the school board um, with all your agreement. Um, and I will be putting out to you, you know, some time slots for you to sign up for in order to be at the table. We want to be able to greet the public, let them know who, who we are, and, um, you know, see if we can get some additional emails from people who don't have kids in the schools particularly. So um, that's, that's planned for November 4th. and. I'll be getting that sign-up sheet to you shortly. Uh, teacher, teacher evaluation. evaluation. I was unable to attend the last meeting. Maybe Mrs. Sizemore wants to make a comment. Well, we're working on um, eye observation, getting our leadership. Uh, they had this training, and now it's going in and working with it. And uh, we'll have a consultant with us on Tuesday <coughs> to help us work through that. The uh, teacher educator development team, which is like the steering committee for the program, uh, we have, we're still continuing to work on the handbook. Um, the state has put out a handbook, but uh, it's not 
some of us were still trying to figure out what the state was trying to say in it. So <laughs> we're working through this. Uh, best, best to just set it aside. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But so we're working. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, policy committee has been meeting. Uh, we are hopefully going to um, at our next business meeting. So a month from now, we'll have some policies um, before the board for uh, possible revision for transportation and the way that the school department handles um, distributing information for outside entities. Um, so we're working on we're working on revising and reviewing those policies. Okay. Thank you, Jody. Anything on the business? Yes, we have a meeting coming up on Thursday, October 16th at SEDCO. Okay, thank you. And <coughs> I'm assuming you don't wish to make a report since you, maybe you do. Well, I have other committees that I sit on, Oh, too. that's right. I'm sorry. Please. Yeah. I'm sorry. I share them with you, so that's I mean, great. I didn't want to steal okay. your thunder, though. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. You actually attended the meeting. I did not. Uh, actually, I did not I did not attend the past, the recent past uh, WRVTC meeting on the 18th, so right. I would also have to defer to Mrs. Sizemore to be able to um, fill, in our fill us in on that one. Um, <laughs> this is the first meeting of the year. It was well attended. Uh, they are... Um, PATH is continuing to work on their calendar so they can meet the state requirement. We are with the Westbrook Group, which we have met the state requirement. Um, they went through the different programs, um, and it's up and running, and the enrollment is up at the school. Okay. Uh, we've also started to uh, participate in the Sebago Alliance meetings as well that come um, monthly, I believe. Um, I did attend the first one, and... Um, there's been some some changes um, through the Sebago Alliance, especially in the in the Alliance School. Um, very positive. Um, it's a good um, a good example of collaboration among districts, and I'm hoping that we can get some some good ideas. Looking at that model, maybe even to implement something in town in terms of different departments or something, how we can work together. So that was uh, that was very positive. Um, finance, obviously, we met today before the meeting. You saw the results of that. Um, and we will probably be doing end first quarter um, sometime next month. And <coughs> I believe that's that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. So oh wait, I'm sorry. One, one more thing. Sorry, didn't Jackie. Um, if, for all you guys who don't know, the the Spirit Challenge. They actually the clips are still online, I believe, to be able to go and see those. And if you haven't had a chance to look at them yet, they are uh, they're they're very impressive. Really good. Very very impressive. Jackie. Uh, I don't think you mentioned uh, in your remarks that the, the uh, Education Foundation is also having a fundraiser on the 9th of October oh. at Portland Pie. Thank you. I did not. And it's starting at 5 o'clock, and a percentage of whatever you buy at Portland Pie uh, is going to the foundation. And they've been most generous with, Portland Pie has been most generous with the school district, as have other businesses in town. I'm not just touting them, but uh, this one is for the foundation. And also want to say that our own Kristen Murray has been tearing up the field hockey field and uh, <laughs> doing very well and uh, hope to uh, most of our teams are doing well. All right. With regards to Portland Pie, you can go all month long, and um, they have different specials, that, things that kids can do that um, proceeds from that paint a pumpkin or um, color a pumpkin, paper pumpkin, all of that goes to the Education Foundation all month long. At Portland Pie? At Portland Pie in oh, Scarborough. Yeah. The one in Portland goes to the Portland Education Foundation. They do it at all their locations. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, <coughs> thank you. All right. So the will of the board this evening, I see nothing else on our agenda. Motion to adjourn. Okay, I like that motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay. Oh, I <laughs> jumping at that second. Great. All in favor of adjourning this evening. Seven plus two. Meeting adjourned. The meeting Thank you very much.